you know, might get security fixes or other uh, small updates, but they're never really uh, bumped to a newer kernel version. And this is fine. Uh, for the most part, users don't care. Um, devices come fully enabled, um, so, you know, moving to a newer kernel isn't going to bring any new functionality uh, to that device. Um, so it really just doesn't have much user benefit. <clears throat> But there are some benefits. It's just that the benefits uh, to running mainline on form factor devices are for kernel developers and Android developers. Um, you know, the first here being uh, the ability to validate changes. So if, if changes go upstream, things like scheduler changes, et cetera, um, currently we don't have any way to uh, test those on uh, mobile devices. Um, and so sometimes it can be quite a while till we see the effect for mobile environments for good or bad. Um, so this would, being able to run mainline on form factor devices enables uh, some more CI, uh, continuous integration. Um, <clears throat> it also allows for more experimentation. Um, if there's some new functionality that's been added to uh, uh, the kernel upstream, um, if we want to try to adapt Android to make use of this functionality, um, currently, uh, if you really want to validate it on a real device, you need to backport that new functionality some, to some ancient kernel that might be multiple years old. Um, you know, and th that's just problematic. It, it, as part of the Android upstreaming work that we've done, um, there's been a number of cases where we've taken functionality and uh, from the Android uh, kernel patch set, and we've tried to find kind of a, a solution that could go upstream, and we did what seemed appropriate at the time. But then it took, you know, basically a year, a year and a half before the Android developers pick up a stable kernel with that, and they try to integrate it on a real product, and sometimes that works and sometimes it hasn't. So this is kind of a real problem. Now, there are dev boards that can run mainline, that we can run Android on, um, and, and they are useful for a lot of testing. Um, but dev boards miss out on a lot of the functionality that's really unique to the mobile environment. Um, you know, they, they rarely have batteries or USB charging. Um, they're not very frequently connected to multi-touch touch screens. Uh, they don't have acceleration sensors or orientation sensors. Um, quite often, they don't even have Bluetooth or Wi-Fi support. Um, uh, enabled yet, and so it, it, there's really quite a big, a, a big gap in the testing that can be done on um, uh, device boards or dev boards uh, uh, compared to form factor devices. Um, another uh, benefit, uh, this one's kind of more, more a theory, but uh, um, I, I, I think that it would enable more selfish maintainer interest. Um, now, Linus only started Linux because he wanted to tinker with his, you know, 3D6 machine. Um, and I think most maintainers probably have an Android device. They might have a tablet or a phone. Um, but I don't think there's the same pride of ownership that they have uh, when compared to kind of their desktop machine that runs the latest and greatest of what they kind of consider their kernel. Um, and so, you know, hopefully by enabling a, a mainline to run on devices, they might be more interested in tinkering with them and more interested in the use cases uh, for mobile. And finally, I think uh, this would all improve collaboration because you know, if we do find an issue with the uh, um, mainline kernel running on an uh, Android device, um, we can engage with the Android developers earlier, and this allows us to kind of uh, find a, a solution that's workable for both upstream and uh, the Android team. Um, instead of waiting you know, a couple of years later when the Android guys pick up the stable kernel, if they run to a problem, they're just gonna hack around it, and so that causes more divergence between mainline and the Android uh, tree. So there's a number of barriers uh, uh, that keep mainline from running on uh, uh, form factor devices. And uh, the first kind of uh, issue is hardware, and there's a number of key requirements. Uh, the first is an unlockable bootloader. Basically, we need to be able to support fast boot OEM unlock. Um, now, Andrew Boy uh, from Intel gave a talk at ELC earlier this year about uh, the work his company is doing, as well as I'm sure of others, uh, with Google to enable um, all of these different kind of boot flows. And so this um, charts from the Android website, but it basically shows that uh, the bootloader can now support, or the bootloader, I guess, bootloaders can support uh, a verified OEM uh, uh, secure boot, um, as well as using user key secured boot, uh, then fully unlock, and also a, a tampered uh, boot state. Um, and this is really interesting because it, it's a lot of thoughts gone into this, and it provides a lot of flexibility for things like, you know, people can do development, but it also provides the information to users so that they know exactly the state of their device. Um, unfortunately, most of this is optional. And so most OEMs are likely to just disable everything except for the OEM verified boot path. Um, and so, you know, while some vendors will continue to allow a, a fast boot OEM lock, um, you know, the fact that most don't kind of eliminates a, a large swath of hardware from being uh, uh, usable for upstream development. 
The second big issue is access to the serial UART. Um, without serial access, it's really almost impossible to do any sort of low-level kernel development or uh, debugging. Um, the problem is, is that most vendors don't want to put a DB9 connection on their consumer devices. Um, and so they can tend to hide it somewhere inside where you have to crack the case and solder onto t little teeny pins. Um, and, and this is just uh, frustrating because it makes it very, it just adds another barrier to doing any sort of development on a device. Um, now Google has a really interesting solution with their uh, headphone debug UART. Um, basically with the right cable, if you plug it into a Nexus device, you will get the serial transmit and receive out of the left and right headphone lines. Um, and basically, uh, Colin Cross has actually gone through and, and published the real spec for this. There's a lot of kind of pseudo information on the web on how to build this cable, but this is the real uh, uh, image from the Google. Um, and I, I love this approach. I think it's great. Uh, every device from servers, you know, desktops, tablets, phones, they all have headphone jacks. Um, and I think this would be a really, it's a really accessible way to kind of uh, hide a serial port. Um, but, you know, there are some drawbacks. Um, so I guess some vendors feel like they don't want to put anything in the audio path that might compromise audio quality. Um, I don't know how much this is a real concern or not. Uh, people have said it is a real issue, but, uh, you know, it may just be for the super high fidelity folks. Um, and so this isn't necessarily a solution that works for everybody. Um, as a tangent, uh, if you look at the USB-C uh, uh, pin, <laughs> pins, there, there's a lot of them. Um, and uh, USB-C also supports a number of what are called alternative modes. So you can run things like DisplayPort over USB-C or Thunderbolt over USB-C. Um, so it might be possible to do something where we take, you know, the second lanes of super speed uh, uh, lines and uh, basically, uh, you know, create a serial over USB-C alternative mode. Um, I think this would be really awesome because it would be another nicely kind of accessible but uh, not uh, super visible uh, uh, solution. Um, so yeah, so if anybody's interested in something like this or, or considering implementing something like this, I, I'd love to talk with them, especially if you have any uh, uh, kind of interest in uh, USB standards, uh, because we do need to have some sort of a standard for this. Uh, the next issue is avoiding binary blobs. Um, this issue's kind of been well-tread. Um, GPU drivers tend to be the biggest problem. Um, but, uh, you know, there are also other cases that can be problematic. So uh, uh, firmware for devices, things like uh, uh, Bluetooth or USB, or uh, I'm sorry, Bluetooth or uh, um, Wi-Fi firmware um, can, can be problematic because if those firmware blobs aren't redistributable, um, a number of maintainers won't accept uh, uh, device support um, or driver support upstream. Um, so it's an issue that we have to kind of also address. And, and this basically ends up affecting what devices we're able to choose uh, uh, to, to do development on. Now, the Android kernel patches, despite lots of work, uh, uh, there still are out of tree Android kernel patches. Um, so that's the next uh, issue here. Um, now, since 3.4, we have been able to run um, Android on mainline kernels. Um, but usually that's in kind of a QEMU uh, VXpress environment or maybe on, like, you know, back then it was on the Panda boards. Um, and so that's still somewhat of a limited environment. So you're de still dealing with software rendering and um, uh, uh, you know, mouse and uh, keyboard input for uh, uh, testing. Um, so it has somewhat limited use for validation. Um, there has been continued progress. So here's kind of a chart uh, showing kind of the uh, decreasing number of uh, patches as well as the uh, diff stats um, from uh, uh, the different Android uh, common.git uh, releases. Um, and hopefully we'll be seeing even further uh, uh, improvement over time. Overall, this basically means that the Android patch sets are becoming less and less of an issue. Um, there are a few remaining areas here that we have to work on. Um, so the uh, gadget, uh, Android gadget driver, which uh, I gave a good talk about yesterday, and so that should hopefully be uh, uh, shrinking. Um, there is ADF, which uh, we're looking at trying to uh, address uh, continually. Um, NetFilter still needs some work for the NetFilter accounting. Um, the FICA debugger is, is still there at the moment, despite a lot of great work that uh, Daniel's done. Um, and then the uh, CPU, the interactive CPU frequency governor, um, which hopefully will be uh, needed less when EAS lands. Um, yeah, but uh, overall, you know, we're, we're reducing the need for this. And uh, the other issue with these is that, for the most part, most of the stuff that is out of tree isn't strictly necessary in order to get a decent uh, Android environment for testing. Um, and the other fact is that it is fairly easy to forward port these to newer mainline kernels. This is something that Lenaro does quite regularly. So th these aren't as much of a blocker as they used to be. Um, what the more problematic areas are things where we have infrastructural differences. 
Um, so this is where basically the Android uh, uh, interfaces in, the, in their kernel um, are, are drastically different with what the upstream kernel wants to use. Um, so a, a good example is in the graphics how, where most devices are using ADF for binary blob uh, uh, graphics drivers. And um, you know, upstream we want to use KMS and DRM. Um, and so basically this means that if we want to uh, use an upstream kernel, we also need to replace the entire graphics house. We need a new hardware composer in Graloc, and uh, we need to use uh, uh, you know, Mesa for GL. Um, so basically we're not just replacing a kernel here. You're having to kind of rebuild the entire system image. Um, so that, that's a little bit of a, a difficulty. Now, kind of the biggest issue right now um, is the lagging upstream SOC support. And this is something that Tim Bird's been talking about recently. Um, here's a chart that I made of the deltas uh, for basically the Nexus trees uh, that Google releases. Um, and you can see the little blue bits down there are the same blue bits from the previous uh, chart. Um, and so you can see how much the uh, vendor SOC code really just dwarfs the uh, Android kernel patch sets. Um, we're looking at basically one to two million lines of code here. Um, apparently for the uh, non-Google trees, it's up to three million in some cases. Um, so it can be uh, quite drastic. Um, now, some vendors have been getting much better at this recently. Um, we can see, you know, for a, a series of devices, Flow, Hammerhead, Shamu, that's all one vendor, so it, it, they're, you know, improving in that direction there. Um, and hopefully uh, with uh, newer kernels, so if we see, a, you know, 318 devices uh, uh, released, um, we'll hopefully see even further improvement. Another pain point is uh, device tree conversion. So right now, most devices on the market, uh, with a few exceptions, um, are 3.4 based. And so that's the sort of back in the board file era. Um, so if you're trying to bring up mainline on these devices, this means that you need to do the full device tree conversion, which is really quite painful. Um, now, hopefully this will recede in uh, importance because a number of devices are being shipped with device tree with 3.10. But that's still, you know, 12 kernel versions behind, so the bindings may have shifted a little bit since then. Um, so given the requirement for, you know, unlockable bootloader, serial access, uh, avoiding binary graphics blobs, um, I basically picked the Nexus 7 as kind of a, a candidate to try to bring uh, mainline up on. Um, and I, you know, would like to give a demo, but uh, it's actually not that interesting at the moment, so <laughs> I'll just tell a quick status. Um, we've got uh, the device booting off of MMC. Uh, we have the volume and power buttons working with the GPIOs. Um, we've got uh, the touch panel input providing input. Um, we've got uh, USB support uh, working and uh, the USB gadget working with ADB as well as with uh, MTP, um, although that's a little finickier. <laughs> um, and then, uh, let's see here, there's also things like the reboot uh, uh, boot reasons, so we're able to boot straight into the bootloader. Um, I think that's all of it. Um, and I really wanted to have the panel working uh, for a demo, but uh, I haven't yet done that. And I've already been outdone. Bjorn Anderson and Rob Clark have uh, both gotten uh, independently their uh, Xperia Z3s up and running uh, and, and gotten the display working. And, and Bjorn's actually apparently even gotten uh, uh, Wi-Fi and um, uh, the cell modem working on his device. And so these are kind of related devices. They're not the exact same. So um, uh, I'm hoping I'll be able to catch up here soon. Um, but uh, lots of kudos to Bjorn. Um, and while I'm saying thank yous, wanted to make sure to give a lot of credits here. Um, I'm, I'm really not writing a lot of code here. I'm basically acting as an integration monkey just to try to put these things together and see uh, what can be done. Um, so I want to make sure that uh, all the folks here and, and everyone else who's helped uh, get stuff upstream and written the drivers uh, for, these, uh, for this device uh, are, are known that they're appreciated. Now, currently, Against uh, 4.3 RC1, I've got about 25 patches in my tree. Um, a lot of those are things like device tree changes. Uh, also, build helpers just trying to integrate into an Android build uh, uh, takes a couple of patches. Um, there are a handful of real features, so things like MMC for uh, support for greater than eight partitions, um, the MTP gadget driver, uh, and uh, the reboot bootloader reason, um, as well as a little bit for the PMIC uh, GPIO support, um, as, as well as a handful of hacks that I'm using just to kind of get things going. It, 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 it just hasn't been done yet, so I, it's one of those, um, yeah. Um, so we still have a lot left to do, um, you know, display <laughs> as it goes through the chart. Um, and, and really this kind of, to, to a great extent, we've gotten the device up to kind of a dev board standard. And so the interesting part that I think uh, um, Liam's made of, maybe pointed out earlier, was the fact that um, a lot of these issues are actually really common across SOCs. So we don't really see a lot of support for, you know, 
all of this um, on, on, on many devices. And, and so this, maybe we need to kind of, um, as kernel maintainers, take heart that you know, maybe the infrastructure that we have isn't really sufficient or it's maybe too complicated for folks to use easily. Um, and so basically I think we need to put some more effort on these sort of issues um, to try to, uh, try to get more uh, vendor code merged uh, to support these devices. Um, if you want to re reproduce it yourself, I've got instructions here. Um, they're online, so you can uh, check it out there if you need. Um, but uh, it, it's all fairly simple if you want to run this on your Nexus 7. Um, and we're already seeing benefits with this. So, um, you know, it's making very clear what the pain points are, um, as well as uh, uh, kind of identifying what code we need to kind of prioritize in getting upstream. Um, and we've already used it as a, a, a test platform to be able to validate uh, the transition from the Android gadget driver to the ConfigVest gadget driver. Um, and so it, it's, it's already starting to prove value. If I was really just wishing and hoping, I'd really love to see something like a $200 Nexus or Nexus Lite tablet uh, released on some uh, decently upstreamed SOC. Um, and I'd also like to see something like the USB-C alternative mode. So that's, you know, if we had, had that, basically we could go around and kind of just airdrop these cheap tablets to maintainers and try to <laughs> see if we could stir up a little more of interest. Um, and so that's it for the uh, first section of my talk. Um, and so I'm gonna move on to uh, the next, which was improving AOSP. So I think uh, AOSP has a problem, and I think we need to admit it. Um, so hi, my name is John, and my company has a number of forked AOSP trees. Um, and most vendors kind of take the approach of you grab AOSP, you fork it, you hack it, you ship it, and you try to forget it. Um, and it's not really the vendor's fault. AOSP doesn't provide the functionality they need, so they need to make modifications. The real problem is just those modifications aren't ever making it back into AOSP in any sort of timely manner. Um, and so this basically means that vendors have to carry more deltas uh, when they're updating to newer versions of AOSP, um, and that can make device updates suffer. And then when we run into uh, security issues, like we've seen with uh, the uh, WebView recently, um, it, it, it becomes a real problem. And so I think that it's important that we find some way to address this. So at Plumbers, we talked about a number of different uh, related problem areas. Um, so a number of vendors are, are trying to target uh, multiple devices. Um, and they're trying to find a way to do this by reducing the amount of vendor sp or device specific code uh, they need to maintain. Um, additionally, so most devices are actually composites um, of a number of different vendors' components. Um, so you have an SOC from one vendor, Bluetooth Wi-Fi wi from another, um, you know, cameras from a third. Um, and trying to integrate all the house for these different devices um, can really can take weeks at times. It's, it's, it's not a very smooth uh, process. Um, additionally, the reference HALs that are in AOSP um, really aren't sufficient for use. Um, so what we end up seeing is a lot of vendors basically maintaining these uh, hacked up versions of ancient uh, uh, AOSP reference house, um, which they probably have better ways to use their time. Um, there's also a lot of documentation that's probably missing, um, for, especially for folks who aren't you know, very tight partners with Google. Um, and this kind of results in a lot of kind of cargo cult style development because people just kind of look to AOSP and the first thing that they see that looks kind of like what they want to do, they just mimic it because there's no documentation to kind of uh, suggest what would be the best way um, for what they're doing. Um, and then finally, uh, there's the collaborative limits of AOSP. Um, now, while anyone can submit code to AOSP, um, the Google has a policy basically for device-specific code um, that they kind of will only accept code that they can validate themselves. And so this basically means that AOSP is limited to Nexus-only devices. Um, and even for Nexus device changes, um, they, they are a little hesitant to uh, merge changes from external uh, contributors. Um, so this basically means that even if a vendor wanted to get involved and submit code, um, there's not a high likelihood that that code's gonna get merged. And so this kind of really uh, uh, kind of keeps any sort of uh, collaborative community uh, kind of developing around AOSP. So on the issue of targeting multiple devices, um, there was a number of different talks uh, by different folks at, at Plumbers. Um, one discussion was uh, by a, a Google engineer uh, talking about their work on uh, Android One. Um, which tries to basically support uh, an entire family of devices using the same system image. Um, we also had a, a talk by a, an Intel developer on the Intel reference design for Android platform. 
um, which is also very similar to Android One. They want to basically support um, a wide array of uh, tablets with all sorts of different hardware configurations um, using basically the same system or the software image. Um, and then finally, uh, we had another talk from uh, Project Dara developers, who uh, basically was talking about um, how they support a, a, a wide array of different modules on their modular phone, um, some of which, which might be developed after the phone ships. So for the Android One solution, um, I kind of consider this a partition time solution. Um, so they basically have gone through and uh, they've found a way to separate the SOC specific code, like graphics and powerhouse, um, the device specific codes, so things like the sensors and cameras, and then the uh, OEM and carrier uh, uh, specific changes like the ringtones and, and images. Um, and they basically separated those out from the system partition. Um, and this basically is really interesting because these partitions are able to be indep updated independently. And so this means that you know, they're able to provide new system images and you don't have to do the normal wait for the vendor to integrate their changes into a system image um, like we, on, on most devices. Um, and it's also particularly nice because the carriers are t carrier changes are completely separate in a separate partition and they just don't get in the way of updates. Um, so this is a, a really interesting way to uh, uh, support it. One of the more interesting aspects too is that for the um, system partition, that partition currently they support across an entire family of devices. Um, but they're actually uh, said that they have plans to, to have a single system image for an entire architecture. So this means for all of ARCH64, there'll be one system image at some point, um, at least ideally. Um, so yeah, so it's, 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 this is, I think, a, a really interesting uh, way to kind of start minimizing the amount of dependencies that uh, people have to get updates. For the Intel reference design uh, uh, for Android uh, platform, um, they have a very similar solution, but it's kind of a boot time solution. Um, so basically on their system software, uh, they, they image, um, they basically include the drivers for all of the devices that they support. Um, and then basically at boot time, there's a daemon that checks uh, the BIOS and bootloader tables and uh, determines kind of what device it's running on and what hardware is there. And then it basically will bind mount in the proper drivers into the file tree. And additionally, for things like the uh, Etsy permissions uh, XML files, they have a fuse file system that generates that on the fly uh, based upon the, those tables. And so this way, they're able to, you know, uh, at boot time, generate the file system that they need to support that device. Now, the Project Ara uh, effort, um, they have to use kind of more of what I call a, a runtime solution because those modules may come and go uh, uh, while the system is running. Um, now, what they're leveraging are basically these standard device classes. So this is very similar to USB, where you have things like mass storage and audio uh, device classes. And these devices, you can plug in. It doesn't matter what the brand of flash drive is or you know, if it was made recently or long ago. Um, as long as it's using that standard interface, you can plug it in, and it'll just work without needing any drivers. Um, and in, ad in addition to that, they're basically also having to modify the HAL layers to be able to uh, adapt Android to be uh, more uh, flexible in the face of dynamic devices coming and going. So they're basically having to modify the HAL layer so that, you know, if a camera uh, module is removed, that image data is still sent to uh, applications that are expecting it so they don't crash. And they're also working with Google to kind of slowly adapt the framework la layers so that uh, the, the higher levels of uh, Android are also uh, aware that things may come and go. So there's these multiple solutions. There's the partition-based customization, the, the, the bind mounting and fuse file system that the uh, Intel guys are using, and these standard device classes and hot plug warehouse that are all trying to address basically a, a very similar problem. And it was interesting because even during the talk, you could see how some of these approaches could be combined. Um, for the Aura effort, one, one issue is that uh, you know, they, they've worked hard to get all of these hot plug warehouse uh, created, but they also want to be able to support different SOC modules in the future. Um, and so basically for each SOC, trying to kind of RAIs it gets a little ugly, um, at least in the build system. And so by separating, it, separating out the uh, house cleanly so that they can live in the ODM partition, you're able to basically take just the SOC specific code and keep it separate uh, uh, from the ARA house. And so that, that was uh, kind of an interesting thing that I, I, I suspect we'll, uh, we'll see more of um, in the future. So they're also on this topic of uh, Im improving, uh, or I guess, ideas for improving uh, targeting multiple devices. Um, we, we, there's some talk about the build uh, system. Um, now one issue is if you go into AOSP and you look in the device directories, there are these board config and device MK files. 
And these basically kind of generate a, just a huge amount of global build variables um, for that device. Um, and quite often, there's just a lot of boilerplate um, between these uh, different files uh, across different devices. Um, and so we see in a lot of vendor trees that because they want to support a, a number of different devices, they are actually um, creating kind of this meta uh, infrastructure um, so that they can create these uh, big config files just once for all of their products. Um, and this is so common, we see it just across vendor to vendor to vendor, that it seems like there needs to be some sort of actual generic solution here in AOSP. So we need to maybe kind of go through and try to kind of configureize these boilerplate chunks of, uh, of build logic. Um, and so the other problem is that the large collection of build variables that uh, are, are generated here, there really isn't any uh, dependency expression between the different configurations. Um, so for example, if you say, well, my board has, uh, uh, board has Bluetooth Broadcom, which you know, should enable uh, building the Broadcom Bluetooth driver. But if you also forgot to set you know, board has Bluetooth, nothing's gonna actually build. And so having to chase down these sorts of little bugs are, are just a major pain. Um, and so it might be nice to have something like we have for the Linux kernel, which is uh, a kconfig. And so this basically allows us to express dependencies between different configurations um, so that you know, you're going to get a valid uh, uh, configuration at the end of the day. Um, and so maybe we could have something like this for AOSP, and if, if enough work was done kind of pulling all that boilerplate out into logical chunks, we might be able to have it so instead of having to create a device directory for your device, you might be able to provide you know, the required house and then just a config file. And that way, like much as the kernel, you know, all we need is really a def config to support a new device. You don't have to add a whole directory with a new make build file. So um, th this is one idea that we might be able to uh, uh, kind of do some research on and to see what can be done. Um, on the issue of vendor and reference hows, um, so I guess the, uh, um, the how layer in Android provides this kind of uh, a high level hardware abstraction. Um, and, and it's very nice because uh, uh, it, you know, quite often for new functionality, um, which Android sees quite often, um, different vendors are doing very different things. And there's not necessarily a commonly agreed interface at the kernel level to do those things, um, especially early on. And so basically these uh, HAL abstractions allow you know, vendors to implement whatever support they need using whatever kernel interface they need to get that functionality. Um, and so it provides a lot of flexibility. It allows you know, this functionality to come out to real products uh, sooner. But over time, those, that bit of functionality usually does get sort of some sort of uh, uh, standardized interface at the kernel level. And the kernel really is what's supposed to provide the, the hardware abstraction for uh, the system. Um, and so we start to see a lot of vendors who just have you know, different implementations of using the same kernel interfaces. Um, and so there, there might be some good uses to trying to unify that and try to reduce the amount of duplication that different vendors have. Um, Rob Herring's got a talk tomorrow on, on this. Um, and, and so we're kind of starting to look into how we can try to uh, uh, condense those howls down um, and, and, and avoid the duplication. Um, another uh, kind of related issue is the fact that the reference howls in AOSP aren't sufficient for anyone's real use. Um, and so these vendors are again maintaining kind of very similar uh, howls uh, that have slight tweaks for different hardware. And so maybe by just extending the reference howls and, and getting them to support a wider array of hardware, um, we could just avoid those vendors having to maintain any of that. Um, one howl in particular that I think uh, needs some work is the KMS and DRM based uh, uh, graphics howl. Um, so again, most devices use uh, ADF or some other proprietary graphics howl. Um, and there really isn't a well-polished and uh, a fully featured uh, um, KMS and DRM based one, which is kind of what the upstream uh, kernel uh, would like to use. Um, now, Lenar has been doing work in this area and they, we continue to, um, and, but I think we could do a better job maybe publicizing the work that we're doing and, and trying to find a way to uh, uh, kind of share and collaborate with others in the community who are also working on this. So it's, it's an area that hopefully we'll be working more on. Another issue that we need to do is also improve um, the KMS and DRM based hardware composers to use some of the newer features that have been landing upstream like the atomic mode setting. Um, on best practices, uh, you know, again, having better reference house I think would be important so people could see kind of uh, uh, how things should best integrate into the AOSP tree. Um, 
Additionally, if you go on the Android uh, website, uh, most of the documentation is really focused on uh, Android app developers, not on device developers. There used to be some of those pages that were focused on kind of helping folks out uh, in developing devices, but those kind of disappeared over time. Now, recently, we have seen a few of those pages reemerge, so maybe this is a, a, a directional change, but um, as far as what the external community can do, I think is uh, we could probably try to put some more effort in, in providing tutorials, and so basically, you know, trying to find ways that we can write how-tos and other methods um, to kind of show members and folks in the larger community um, how best to implement a HAL and, and, and get it to integrate cleanly um, in the AOSP, especially with things like the Android One uh, partitioning system coming. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, just advising vendors and members to ship, you know, their custom applications uh, that uh, they, they, they tend to add to devices as APKs via the store. Um, rather than integrating with the system image so that there's just one less dependency required uh, in order to uh, update devices. Um, so finally, on the topic of collaborating with AOSP, um, again, since uh, AOSP really is kind of uh, uh, focused on Nexus uh, uh, hardware, and so any sort of device-specific support, uh, we need to find some other place for that if we're going to have a community to share that. Um, and so trying to find some, some community where we can share those uh, uh, HALs uh, uh, is going to be needed. Um, another idea was to, uh, you know, while um, you know, anyone can submit uh, patches to Garrett, um, only Google is able to merge uh, a, a code into AOSP. So they kind of have the final say on everything. But an interesting aspect of Garrett is that anyone who has an account can go in and review patches. And so basically, um, I think it would be interesting to see more uh, effort on going into Garrett and providing kind of community reviews and cross-vendor reviews of, of patches, much as like we do in the Linux kernel community. Um, and this actually has uh, some other importance because one, it could help develop a sense of kind of code taste in the community, um, but it also will help show uh, uh, kind of whose reviews that uh, Google might be able to trust. Um, and this is important because we've seen some really great examples with uh, the ARM team who's been working on art, so Serban over there and others, <laughs> um, where basically they've done such a great job with the AR64 artwork um, that you know, their uh, reviews on AOSP are basically sufficient to get code merged. And so this is really, I think, a, a shining example of, of uh, delegated maintenance that Google's kind of started to trust external parties um, on this. And I think we could try to expand this more and try to do more to gain that sort of trust for uh, other subsystems. So yeah, so that's it. Thanks for listening to the spew of words. <laughs> if there's any questions, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Pretty close. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned on the common Git, like around 25% patches are spewed over everywhere. Uh, what, why there is a big chunk of uh, patches everywhere? Uh, do, is there any analysis done on uh, how much of it is really critical for Android to bring up? Um, yeah, so, uh, so actually, as far as uh, basic bring up, there's very little that is critical. There are some things um, that are important for performance. Um, so there's uh, things like the uh, uh, per task slack uh, or timer slack uh, variables. So they're very small patches, but they are, again, all over the place. Um, so it, it is uh, hard to kind of narrow down on specific ones that are very key, but I think kind of the most critical stuff, for the most part, is upstream. Um, so it's, it's the, the smaller ones we are trying to address as we kind of find them and figure out uh, what the right solutions are, so. And uh, at least uh, some instances of these patches, what I've seen is, uh, uh, there are like under review patches uh, in different mailing lists and even in Garrett. Uh, some of them are basically abandoned, like you know, uh, over the process of review, but still they are lying in Google Common Git. And we had to figure out in a bad way to fix these issues, like you know, some customer reporting this, and we found out that those patches never made it to upstream. So, is there uh, any effort uh, from? Uh, Linaro or even Google, do you know if such cleanup is going to happen in common Git? Um, so about every year, uh, uh, Linaro goes through kind of the latest um, AOSP commentary. 
And we try to kind of categorize all the different patches, you know, what areas they're focused on, you know, if there's anything critical like that, that what, what sort of would be something that would be good to send upstream. Um, there are a lot of things where, you know, you send it upstream and people are like, no, 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 not like that, you know, and so it's, it's even though they're small patches, uh, one example would be like the paranoid networking code, which is never gonna make it upstream. Um, and, and, and that's one of those things where it's a very small and elegant change to do it right requires a large overhaul of the Android user space. And so that's one of those things where it's gonna be, you know, in order to get that functionally up to stream, it's gonna take a lot of work outside of the kernel. Um, and, and so, um, you know, we, we, we try to do that, but a lot of the small changes can be somewhat deceiving. Um, but yeah, we, we do try to uh, catch anything we can that, you know, seems to be urgent. Um, I, I, I hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, one more question on, uh, so really, like, you know, even though Google removed the experimental tag on some of the kernels, like 3.14, uh, what we have seen over the uh, process of trying to actually prioritize it is uh, simple things like build breaks or even the driver doesn't even compile kind of instances, even though Google removed the experimental tag on top of it. So uh, I believe 3.10 and 3.18 are the only productizable kernels which are there today. Uh, so, so what what is your take on it? Like, you know, if, if tomorrow Google comes up with like a 4.1 baseline, how much do we know that actually they are releasing a product or is just a rebased baseline? Yeah. Um, so this is a, a, an area of, of pain. So, um, oh, yeah. So I guess uh, uh, you know, I think when Google releases these common branches, um, these are common branches that at least their team are focusing on for specific products. I think. Um, there are some extra branches that maybe were for products or maybe aren't continuing on or, you know, it's one of those kind of false starts maybe. I'm, I'm not sure on some of them. But we do see a number of cases where uh, for the branches that aren't getting a ton of shared use, um, that aren't in the later stages of productization for Nexus devices, um, we do see a lot of build breaks. And, and that's something, you know, we try to catch as part of like you know the the, the LSK previews and then you know that, but it's 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 hard. So um, yeah, if you run into those things, um, being able to feed those either back to Lenaro or to AOSP, I think would be really important because to some extent, um, you know, it, part of the benefit of, of having at least a central source like AOSP is that there's a lot of people who are using it, and so there's more people testing it, and there's more people feeding code back to it. And so basically, you're, you're distributing the testing effort amongst all the other folks who are using those trees. And so if everybody's just kind of using their own private trees and hacking it up based on some you know, half-stabilized kernel, um, you don't get the shared benefit. Um, so I, it's one of those things where, yeah, definitely if you're running into those sorts of issues, you know, please engage with uh, AOSP directly, or if you need help with that, Linaro's happy to, to yeah, do that too. Yeah, on 3.14, I'm glad that Linaro is helping whenever we find some issues and getting them where they belong, either directly to Google Review Baseline or even from Linaro LSK, so thanks for that. Yeah, oh. Anything else? So, mainstream uh, Linux community have long-term solutions and pretty aged solutions for update and like per device configuration of our system is package management. And uh, it seems it's like uh, purposely being avoided for Android and USB. For example, this uh, partition-based configuration is like poor man package management. So, is anyone thinking about uh, this approach and any chances that um, Android is going that way? I suspect not quite yet. Um, it's, I, I, yeah, it, it, it's the idea of something like a real packet ma package management would be nice, um, but I think the idea is that people want such a level of flexibility um, that they want to go in and tweak any possible project uh, for their device, and so. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's one of those things where it, it, I, I think, yes, being able to have those more uh, componentized updates are nice. The, the other downside, though, with that is that by having, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, distributions are also looking at using more full system image releases. And so things like Snappy and other cases, uh, the Chrome OS guys use, um, where 
you know, being able to know what exactly devices run is really important. And so, you know, trying to do the thing where, well, well, we updated this and updated that. You can't kind of get a full system image after that, but it, it, I think it's just something that they're more comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I definitely think as far as the, for the build system, the idea of more kind of some of the package management tools would be useful because when you are adding a, a project to the product pack packages, um, quite often there are inter-package dependencies and there's no way to see that or resolve it. So you could add, you know, you want to run this, you know, VPN stuff, but PPP may not actually show up in the build. Um, and so you can get a build that doesn't work. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of missing uh, functionality from similar to what other distributions have solved in the past. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you so much.